Good afternoon. My name is Pearl McKinney, and I welcome our Zoom audience as well as our in-person audience to the eighth annual Revival Law Southern Voices. This started when Andy Rogers and I had conversations at the Decatur Book Festival, and then it was made possible by uh, not just Andy and me, but by Allison Law, who you might have heard from yesterday, uh, Anna Schachner, who is currently on our advisory board with Andy and me, and also then right away, uh, Gina Flowers joined to make it Southern by bringing in sort of things. And then later she was joined by Carrie Miller, who is here someplace. Brewing coffee. Brewing coffee for us for later. And then Joe Davich and Allie Wright Stonewright. Sorry, Allie Stonewright. Uh, in that very first revival of Lost Southern Voices, we revived such people that we have now lost, uh, such as Terry Kay was here reviving people. Natasha Trethaway talked about uh, Margaret Walker Alexander. You already heard that Yusef Komunyaka joined us. Uh, we talked about uh, Judith Ortiz Kofer, so many people. And now in the eighth one, we're still helping people to know who is Southern, who might be lost, who in fact has a voice that we haven't been hearing lately. This is all made possible by the Georgia Center for the Book, by the DeKalb Library Foundation, by the Georgia Humanities Council, who has been here with us from the very beginning, helping us to tell people that the humanities are not dead. They are the lifeline to our present and to our future. This morning, this afternoon, uh, Andy Rogers is going to introduce our first panel on Thomas Wolfe. Let me give you a little information about Andy. He's taller than I am. <laughs> He's smarter than I am. His hair used to be longer than mine. <laughs> he is now the Associate Chair of English, Arts, and Humanities at the Decatur campus of GSU, GSU Perimeter. And he's co-coordinator for the Georgia State University Prison Education Project, which you may have heard needs your support and your funding to continue. His scholarly work has been cited in the New York Times. That's more than any of the rest of us up here, I think, can say. Maybe John has. Uh, his best-selling book by da the best-selling book by David Shields and Shane Salerno called Salinger. And he's currently working on a film script with the author, David Shields, who was at our previous Revival Law Southern Voices. Andy got his BA from the University of Texas and his PhD from the University of Alabama. And as I said before, he is one of the co-founders, wouldn't exist without Andy. So Andy, take it away. All right, thank you very much. And if we have any microphone issues, please let us know, um, especially from the virtual audience. Don't be shy about dropping that into the chat. Uh, so our panel here just informed me something I think it's really interesting. This presentation came out of a uh, Retirees Association book club. Um, they read Thomas Wolfe, uh, looked Homeward Angel, and then did a, got really interested and did a deep dive, did some traveling, um, really got passionate about his work and realized, oh, we should carry this all over and do a Lost Southern Voices presentation. So for anyone watching who has a book club, I can tell you how the <laughs> discussion met and, and why it's a good book to think about including. Uh, so our first panelist is going to be Dr. Rosemary Cox. Uh, she's a professor of merit of English from Georgia State University's Perimeter College. At Perimeter College, she taught English composition, literature, and creative writing. She holds a BA and MA degrees from Georgia State University and a PhD in English from Emory University, uh, where she specializes in American literature, particularly antebellum Southern humor. Her academic interests continue to focus on American and British literature of the 19th century, past and present Southern writers, and on writing poetry and memoir. And just to give a brief uh, overview, so Rosemary presents on a short story. This is one of the ways Thomas Wolfe has been rediscovered because uh, his novels are so long. And there was just a long lapse in publishing his short fiction. And when it finally started being published, 
colleges and universities started assigning it because they're like, oh, there's an assignment my students will actually read. Um, so it's a great place to start and to, because uh, a lot of people aren't aware that he was also a great short fiction writer. Mm -hmm. uh, Tim Tarkington will present Look, Look Home Red Angel, most famous novel, give a brief overview of why it'd be exciting to, to take that journey, to, to read a longer novel and why it's worth it. And Ted Wadley's going to talk about Thomas Wolfe's reputation, why he was so famous in his lifetime, faded out for a significant period of time, and then has worked his way back into the literary canon and where he thinks audiences today would sort of pick him up. So I will turn it over to Rosemary for our first panelist. Well, hello and welcome everyone. I'm just delighted to be here and thank you, Andy, for the introduction. Um, I'm actually going to present a paper, and uh, the title of my paper is The Good, the Bad, and the Racial, The Duality of Human Experience in Thomas Wolfe's The Child by Tiger. One reason Thomas Wolfe has fallen into the category of a lost Southern voice is that he held and expresses racist views in his writing. As Leo Gurko points out, our liberal inclination is to deny genius to writers with reactionary opinions or racially bigoted attitudes, to disqualify them in some way as a sign of our disapproval, or at the very least to criticize them severely in our minds. Gurko goes on to know that there are a great many authentic geniuses who fall into that category, including Gogol, Dostoevsky, and T.S. Eliot, who were ferocious anti-Semites, Yates, Pound, and Selene, who were unblinking fascists, Nietzsche and Balzac, who despised democracy and the democratic process, and Conrad and Faulkner, whose attitude toward Negroes was anything but enlightened. Wolf is in good company. His racial prejudice extended beyond African Americans to Jews, European immigrants, especially those in northern cities, and poor southern whites. Paschal Reese believes that race was for Wolf a very general and loose term, which he used for any group he wished to consider as a unit often in including nationality, geographical sections, and occupations. In a letter to his mother, dated April 26, 1930, Wolf praises his own family heritage, suggesting that his ancestors are the only legitimate Americans. I am proud of my people, proud of my pioneer and mountaineer and Pennsylvania Dutch ancestry, and proud of the place I came from. As I walk through the crowded and noisy street of this immense city, he's referring to New York, and look at the dark, swarthy faces of Jews, Italians, Greeks, and all the people of the new America that is roaring up around us here, I realize more keenly than ever that I come from the old Americans, the people who settled the country, who fought its wars, who pushed westward. 21st century readers must not forget that Wolf, born October 3rd, 1900, grew up and lived in the Jim Crow South, where prejudice, particularly against Blacks, was the cultural norm. Reeves maintains that the place of the Negro in the writing of Wolf was determined by Wolf's conception of the Negro's place in society. For the most part, Wolf marginalizes his African American characters, viewing them as inferior. Richard S. Kennedy states that Wolf would not capitalize the word Negro, and he always referred to a Negro girl as a wench. His imagery usually shows revulsion, and generally he treats the Negro characters in animalistic terms. Kennedy goes on to give some examples. The black community in Altamont is jungle. Ella Copening's skin is her pelt. Aunt Ma's disgruntled servant is a poor brute, and so on. Despite these negative portrayals of blacks, particularly in his early work, Wolf began to develop a more enlightened social consciousness after a visit to Nazi Germany in 1936, where he witnessed fascism firsthand. First published as a short story in the Saturday Evening Post of September 11, 1937, and later expanded and included in chapter eight of his novel, The Web and the Rock, after his death in 1939, Wolf's story, The Child by Tiger, certainly illustrates his heightened awareness of and disgust for maltreatment of Blacks. The central figure in that story, Dick Prosser, emerges as the most completely developed Negro character in all of Wolf's fiction. And the story itself is considered one of Wolfe's most polished pieces. In his foreword to the complete short stories of Thomas Wolfe, which was published in 1987, author and poet James Dickey observes, if one wishes to employ conventional fictional standards, it is likely that one would end up by citing The Child by Tiger, a stark and terrible account of a lynching, 
as being the best selection in this book. The story addresses not only the suppressed fear and hatred between whites and blacks, but also expresses the increasing social consciousness that Wolf had started to develop at the end of his writing career. David Herbert Donald states that the 1937 version of the short story demonstrated his widening social sympathies. Donald continues, originally he had intended the story to illustrate the basic savagery of the black race, but over the years, as he became more sensitive to injustice and discrimination, he came to see that Dick Pro in Dick Prosser, the potential for violence that lay in the hearts of all men. Wolf's portrait of Prosser was neither patronizing nor prejudiced. But the child by tiger is so much more complex. Wolf's atypical portrayal of African Americans through the character of Dick Prosser and the mob's rabid desire for revenge transcends racism and reveals the dual nature of innocence and evil, which Wolf believes lies at the core of human experience. Moving beyond his typical autobiographical approach, Wolf based The Child by Tiger on an actual event in Asheville, North Carolina in 1906, when an African-American outlaw from Charlotte named Will Harris slew three blacks and two white policemen in a killing spree. A large posse then tracked Harris down and executed him, displaying his bullet riddled body with one shoe missing in the window of a downtown funeral home. Reeves speculates that Wednesday, November the 14th, 1906, was probably the most exciting day Asheville had known since North Carolina seceded from the Union. Indeed, the newspaper headline proclaimed, Asheville, stirred to its depths, passes the most exciting day in its history. As Wolf was six years old at the time of this event, it's possible that he actually saw Harris's mutilated body in the window. Certainly, he would have listened to first and secondhand accounts of the incident from Asheville residents who talked about it for many years. And later, he could have read the copious newspaper reports about the crime. While The Child by Tiger incorporates most of the real facts of the case, Wolf elevates the story to another level. Reeves comments, to say that Dick Prosser was Will Harris is to ignore the creative ability of Wolf and to miss the main clue to his method, which is synthesis. Reeves continues, even though Wolf took his characters from life, he fused them together in such a way as to produce a character new in depth new in meaning and new in symbolism, even though the original model is perhaps still recognizable. From the very beginning of the story, Wolf sets up the dual dynamic with Dick Prosser, implying that he represents something beyond just an incidental black figure to complement the background of the scene or move the action forward. Prosser is, as Mr. Shepperton declares, the smartest darkie that he'd ever known. He is impeccably neat, keeping his little whitewashed basement room as spotless as a barracks room, and he possesses many skills. The narrator says he could cook, he could tend the furnace, he knew how to drive a car. In fact, it seemed to us boys that there was very little that Dick Prosser could not do. He always knows his place, never transgressing beyond the boundaries of white Southern society. Driving the Shepherdons to church on Sunday morning, Prosser would wait for them throughout the morning service. He would come up to the side door of the church while the service was going on, neatly dressed in his good dark suit, holding his chauffeur's hat respectfully in his hand, and stand there humbly and listen during the course of the entire sermon. He is devoutly religious, reading his Bible every day and singing hymns as he works. And most notably, he has become a true father figure to the boys, Randy Shepperton, Nebraska Crane, Augustus Parderham, and the narrator, Paul Spangler teaching them the correct way to throw a football and make passes, how to build a fire and lift weights, how to box like a champion, and from his expertise acquired from serving in the army, how to shoot a gun. The narrator remembers, he gave a modest demonstration of his prowess one afternoon with Randy's 22 that left us gasping. Prosser's demeanor and relationships with the whites, particularly with the boys, is genuine, demonstrating his incredible capacity for good. But Wolf never describes Prosser's admirable qualities without prefacing his next observations with the question, and yet? Prosser's hand is like that of a fearsome beast, a tiger, his great black paw. And the narrator consistently links Prosser to that great feline. He is cunning and crafty as a cat. And he was there upon you sometimes like a cat. 
Prosser's voice sometimes intimates that there is something mysterious and dangerous lurking beneath his calm demeanor, as the narrator describes. There would be times when he would almost moan when he talked to us, a kind of hymnal chant that came from some deep and fathomless intoxication of the spirit, something in it so dark and strange and full of a feeling that we could not fathom it. Even more significant is the way Prosser reacts to people and things that cross him, with the whites of his eyes turning red, suggesting that he harbors pent-up anger and aggression. For example, when the grossly inebriated Lon Everett crashes into Shepard's in his car, Prosser is driving, and then smashes Prosser in the face, Dick did not move, but suddenly the whites of his eyes were shot with red, his bleeding lips bared for a moment over the white ivory of his teeth, similar to the way a wild animal would bare its teeth when challenged. Again, when the boys discover Prosser has a repeating rifle in a box containing 100 rounds of ammunition on the table in his basement room, Prosser was on us like a cat. He was there above us, his thick lips bared above his gums, his eyes gone all small and red as a rodent's. Albert E. Wilhelm suggests that red on white color imagery functions as a means of indicating the duality of Dick Prosser's character and of foreshadowing his eventual violence. Certainly the red-white imagery vividly predicts the violent rampage Prosser initiates when his first victim, Pansy Harris's husband, is shot and a huge dark stain of blood-soaked snow widened out around him. Besides red and white, black and white imagery also pervades the story, underscoring the duality of good and evil. The evening before Prosser's rampage, a snowstorm sweeps over the town, leaving the narrator overwhelmed with the dual significance of this natural phenomenon. The world was numb. I went to sleep upon this mystery, lying in the darkness, listening to that exultancy of storm, to that dumb wonder, that enormous and attentive quietness of snow with something dark and jubilant in my soul I could not utter. The dark and light contrast continue to foreshadow events as the narrator watches the dark figures of running men across the white carpet of the square. And as he and his friends join them, they sped across the snow white darkness of the square. Like the symbol of the yin and the yang, dark and light, good and evil, together compose the indivisible whole of human experience. Wiley Cash maintains that Wolf's portrait of Prosser embodies the two extremes employed to represent the African-American male in the turn of the century South, the cherubic benevolent servant and the wild lascivious savage. But the duality of goodness and evil is also evident in the Caucasian characters. Randy Shepard and his mother and sisters who stand huddled in the open doorway, white, trembling, holding themselves together, their arms thrust into the wide sleeves of their kimonos, represent the bastion of white Southern womanhood, silently pleading for a return to normalcy. Nevertheless, when Mrs. Shepardon tries to check her son and prevent him from joining the hunt for Prosser, he paid no attention to her. In a similar fashion, when Randy's father urges the boys to remain behind to protect them from potential harm, they ignore him. As Mr. Shepardon backs his car out of the driveway, he spoke absently saying, you boys stay here. Randy, your mother's calling you but we all tumbled in and he didn't say a word. Shepardon's conscience dictates that he should uphold reason and cold headedness, but he gives in to the impulse to join the pursuit. Likewise, the desperate appeals from store owner Cash Eager, Mayor Will Hendershot, and the Lincolnesque Hugh McNair for the mob to abandon their bloodthirsty quest go unheeded. <clears throat> McNair cries out over the clamor, wait a minute, you men, wait a minute. You'll gain nothing. You'll help nothing if you do this thing. He persists in his appeal. Listen to me. This is no time for mob law. This is no case for lynch law. This is a time for law and order. Wait till the sheriff swears you in. But these forces of good are overpowered by the crowd who are writhing angrily like a tormented snake. Evil is personified in the rage of the mob who like wild animals emit a bloody roar. They are not unlike the baying hounds scenting out Prosser's track. Full-throated, howling deep, the savagery of blood was in it, and the savagery of man's guilty doom was in it, too. For them, it is not enough to kill the perpetrator of the crime. They must exhaust all their ammunition on the riddled carcass and hoist him up on a tree, just as they would in a classic lynching. 
And afterwards, they take Prosser's body, that ghastly mutilated thing, and hung it in the window of the undertaker's place for every woman, man, and child in town to see, and for despicable people like Ben Pounders to boast over. Written as a memoir, the adult narrator looks back on this traumatic event and muses on the fascination that evil and the grotesque hold for humans. The narrator remembers, we said we wouldn't look, but in the end we went. And I think it has always been the same with people. They protest, they shudder, and they say they will not go. But in the end, they always have their look. The coexistence of good and evil is incomprehensible to their young minds. We saw it, tried wretchedly to make ourselves believe that once this thing had spoken to us gently, had been partner to our confidence, object of our affection and respect. And we were sick with nausea and fear for something had come into our lives we could not understand that we had never known about before. It was a kind of shadow, a poisonous blackness filled with bewildered loathing. Even though the goodness of life would return, the specter of evil and the, not, the guilt of knowing that they were complicit in the crime by not sharing Prosser's secret would persist. The narrator reflects, the snow would go, we knew. The reeking vapors of the sky would clear away. The leaf, the blade, the bud, the bird, then April would come back again. And all of this would be as it had ever been. The holy light of day would shine again familiarly. And all of this would vanish as an evil dream. And yet, not wholly so, for we would still remember the old dark doubt and loathing of our kind, of something hateful and unspeakable in the souls of men. We knew that we should not forget. Even as a young man, Wolf acknowledged the duality inherent in human nature. In a letter to his mother written in 1923, he maintains, God is not always in his heaven. All is not always right with the world. It is not all bad, but it is not all good. It is not all ugly, but it is not all beautiful. It is life, 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 the only thing that matters. It is savage, cruel, kind, noble, passionate, generous, stupid, ugly, beautiful, painful, joyous. It is all these and more, and it's all these I want to know, and by God I shall, though they crucify me for it. Evil and goodness may coexist in the souls of humankind, but its origins still remain a mystery. In the story, Wolf does not attempt an explanation, but instead refers to William Blake's poem, The Tiger, quoting the fourth and fifth stanzas that question the type of deity that can simultaneously create and contain the dual forces of both good, personified in the lamb, and evil, represented by the tiger. Quoting Blake, the narrator states, what the hammer, what the chain? No one ever knew. It was a mystery and a wonder. As the title of the short story suggests, Prosser embodies both innocence and evil. And reminiscent of the ballad at the end of Melville's Billy Budd, the story ends with Prosser's exploits becoming the subject of legend. The narrator concludes the story by emphasizing Prosser's duality. Prosser came out of the heart of darkness, from the dark heart of the secret and undiscovered South. He was night's child and partner, a token of the other side of man's dark soul, a symbol of those things that pass by darkness and that still remain, a symbol of man's innocence and the token of his mystery, a projection of his own unfathomed quality, a friend, a brother, and a mortal enemy, an unknown demon, two worlds together, a tiger and a child. However, one further mystery remains. Why does Prosser remove his shoes and in effect surrender to the mob? The narrator describes the scene. And here, Prosser did a curious thing. He sat down calmly on the bank and as quietly as if he were seated on his cot in an army barracks, he unlaced his shoes, took them off, placed them together neatly at his side, and then stood up like a soldier, erect in his bare bleeding feet and faced the mob. In the Old Testament, the Bible makes at least two references to removing one's shoes when standing on holy ground. In Ex Exodus 3, Moses witnesses the figure of God in a burning bush. When the Lord saw that he had turned aside to see God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses, and he said, here I am. 
Then he said, do not come near. Take your sandals off your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. Again, in Joshua 5.15, Joshua is commanded to renew his shoes. And the captain of the Lord's host said unto Joshua, Loose thy shoe from off thy foot, for the place whereon thou standest is holy. And Joshua did so. Before he goes on his rampage, Prosser reads and leaves his Bible open to the 23rd Psalm. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. As, Prosser's, as Prosser journeys to his inevitable end, the place where he will meet his God is sacred. And he removes his shoes as a sign of reverence, humility, and respect. And like Moses, he prepares himself to cast off his old life and move on to the next. Prosser, like the reader, cannot explain the power or understand the complexity of God, but he can revere such divinity and recognize the existence of the innocent and wickedness in all humankind. George Hovis remarks, Wolf's fiction shows evidence that he at least intermittently understood his own racism and made great art out of it, the better to help his readers understand their own racism. While The Child by Tiger may not provide answers to life's enigmas, it clearly demonstrates that Wolf uses racism, particularly as it relates to Dick Prosser and the white community, to reveal a deeper universal truth. Thank you. Much more. Okay. Thank you, Rosemary. So next, Tim Tarkington will discuss uh, Look Homer and Angel, most famous novel. So Tim holds a BA in journalism from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill and an MFA in English from the University of North Carolina at Greensboro. Uh, he was an associate professor with us at Perimeter College until he retired in 2017. All right, Tim, thank you. Thank you. Is this okay? Everybody can hear me? Yeah. Okay, great. Um, Thomas Wolfe's Look Homer and Angel. Is written in the style of what is known as a Bildung's Roman, and more specifically, a Kussler Roman, the artistic development of a writer, musician, or virtual artist. Wolf's portrayal of lostness in his autobiographical novel has influenced many contemporary Southern writers. Robert Morgan, when he first read the novel after taking it from the Henderson County, North Carolina Bookmobile in 1960, says, I felt this was a book I'd always been looking for. It was a novel about me. And it was more than a novel. It was a revelation about how ambitious and thrilled and scared I was and how lost I felt. Imagine my exhilaration when I discovered Thomas Wolfe had been born October the 3rd, 1900, the same day on which I was born, 44 years earlier, in nearby Henderson. Yeah, Bill. William Gay, who read Wolfe as a seventh grader. Seventh grader. Amazing. I uh, raised the curtain of the world, he said. It articulated some compulsion to write I had no words for. Wolf made it possible to believe that the stuff of life, with all its awe and mystery and magic, could, by some strange alchemy, be transmuted to the page. The book was insistent. It wouldn't leave me alone. And his search for the stone, the leaf, the unfound door, sang in the blood like an hallucinatory drug. He may have not have located that unfound door, but he came closer than anyone else. And this may be the key to an understanding of Wolf's quest through art, to find a way to revelation and salvation. In his preface to the reader, he states, it was written in innocence and nakedness of spirit, and that his main concern was to give fullness, life, and intensity, the sum of all the moments of our lives. The Coward Angel is Wolf's thinly disguised autobiographical attempt to answer the question, what would it be like to be the sensitive, gifted child born to middle-class parents uh, in, in, in middle-aged parents in the mountains of North Carolina? Oh, Oliver Grant, the stonecutter father, born in Pennsylvania, has arrived in Altamont, North Carolina, a widower from Sydney, the state capital, to set up a shop in the town square. One day, a younger woman, Eliza Fenton, walks into his shop for selling books. In conversation, she tells him about what she would do if the land, she could buy some land. She has come out of the Reconstruction South, hungry for the profits she sees in owning the land. They wed, and Grant builds them a house. The picture of his soul, the wed, they wed, and Grant builds them a house. The picture of his soul, the garment of his will. But for Eliza, 
is a piece of property. This, in short, distinguishes the environment to which each of their children come. Of the nine children uh, born in the first 11 years of marriage, only six survived to adulthood. Eugene, their youngest, was born in 1900 when Oliver is 50 and Eliza is 42. He is well speaker uh, in, the, in the story, his protagonist, the surrogate wanderer genius. The novel is his story of the buried life. Here we find the major themes of Eugene's quest for knowledge, his search for a ghost language, which when found within this world, will open the door to heaven and salvation and resurrect his buried life. And so he calls for the muse to sing in him what his life's intention is to be. A stone, a leaf, an unfound door, of a stone, a leaf, a door. And of all the forgotten faces, naked and alone, we come into exile. In her dark womb, we did not know our mother's face. From the prison of her flesh came, we come into the unspeakable and incommunicable prison of this earth. Which of us has known his brother? Which of us has looked into his father's heart? Which of us has not remained forever prison pent? Which of us is not forever a stranger and alone? A waste of loss in the hot mazes, lost among bright stars on the most weary, unbright cinder, lost. Remembering speechlessly, we seek the great forgotten language, the lost lane in into heaven, a stone, a leaf, an unfound door. Where? When? Oh, lost and by the wind, greed, ghosts come back again. So, Le Covert Angel becomes Wolf's Kufler Roman, his artist novel, a class of buildings Roman or apprenticeship novel which deals with the youth and development of an individual who becomes or is in the threshold of becoming a poet writer. The main model for Wolf uh, was James Joyce's portrait of the artist as a young man, where Wolf has noted in his story of a novel, his book, he talked about the writing of, of Le Convert Angel. He said, the effort to apprehend and make live again a moment in lost time is so tremendous that Joyce really did succeed, at least in places, in penetrating reality. It is this moment of lost time, this penetration of reality, the reaching into the transcendence of the all flowing images of existence that fired Wolf's artistic passion. He says his autobiographical hero, Eugene Gant, on a lifelong quest of self discovery, armed with the symbols of a stone, a leaf, an unfound door, to seek the great forgotten language, the lost lane in into heaven. Eugene thus comes into this life a chosen with a chosen incandescence, a hero with a secret heart, a stranger in a strange land, an exile even in his own home. He has come into the unspeakable and incommunicable prison of the earth, a glowing light set upon this most weary, unbright star. Eliza, seeing, seeing a premonition of his heroic struggle, weeps for him. The hour after his birth, he looked in his dark, she looked into his dark eyes and had seen something loneliness. She knew a stranger had come to life, fed by the most, I mean, the lost communications of eternity, his own ghost, haunter of his own house, lonely to himself and the world, oh, lost. So Eugene, from birth armed with innate genius, is set upon a quest to recapture the lost time of eternity from which he sprang. He realizes that he had been sent from one mystery into another. The ghost of memory walked through his mind, and for a moment, he felt that he had almost recovered what he had lost. But in order to recapture, he must escape. He has been born into a turbulent yet close family and listens intently to the speech around him. For even before he has symbols for words, he realizes that his first escape must come through language. Later in the novel, Eugene, in a fit of anger and resentment, tells his mother, the first move I ever made after the cradle was to crawl for the door and every move I have made since has been an effort to escape. Eugene's brother, Ben, and his father both share the notion of a secret self, and all three are identified with the symbolic a stone, a leaf, and unfound door, Will symbols of the quest of self-exploration. In their own ways, they search for that door which would open, which when open, will penetrate reality for them. Within themselves, they carry the evidence of their tragic faults. They walked alone in the darkness, death and the dark angels hovered. 
By the time Ben significantly enters Eugene's spiritually unfolding life, he has dropped out of school, gone to work at the newspaper, and is living in sufficient bitter pride upon his earnings. He comes and goes from the house like a phantom. He spends hours absorbed with G Eugene. They develop a secret communication to which the life of the family had neither access nor understanding. He is the patron of Eugene's artistic secret self. He is the shadow, apart but remote from the Gantian full-blooded partisanship. Ben seeks some entrance into life, some secret undiscovered door, a stone, a leaf that might admit him into light and fellowship. As Ben comes to represent the dark side of a frustrated spiritual quest, so Oliver, Oliver Gant, the father, comes to represent the frustration of the artistic quest. Eugene's father is the largest character outside Eugene in Blue Conward Angel. From him, Eugene inherits his ancestral hunger for voyages, his attempts at devouring the world and all the flowing life, river of life around him, and of course, his quest of a stone, a leaf, a door. He sees his father as no common craftsman, but a master. Gant is the roaring fire of the novel with his outrageous drunken forays into physical and rhetorical abuse. He is raucous, passionate center of the Gantian home of Eugene's early childhood. In his tragic consciousness of time, he saw the passionate fullness of his life upon the wane, and he cast about him like a senseless and infuriate beast. He is the alien in an alien land, uh, the outsider robbed now of his far wanderings. But as a young man of 15 walking down a Baltimore street, he had seen an angel carved in stone in a shop window and felt he wanted more than anything in the world to carve delicately with a chisel. He wanted to carve an angel's head. He sought the great forgotten language, the lost lane end into heaven, a stone, a leaf, a door. But he can never carve the angel's head correctly. Instead, he buys a sculpted angel for the front of his shop, calling it his white elephant, when in fact, it really was his unrequited muse. <laughs> but when the madam of the local house of ill repute wants to buy it for the grave of one of her prostitutes, he sells it to her. Once the transaction is completed, Gant stands on the porch of his shop where the angel had stood, and all about him, in frozen, was frozen in a picture, Life was held like an arrested gesture, a photographic abeyance, and Gant felt himself alone, moved deathward in a world of scenes. He is forever frustrated in his quest, and when he fails to achieve this artistic ideal, he escapes into savage drunkenness. Maybe Wolf had this in mind when in the story of the novel, he says that in an artist's quote, work there is contained not only the seeds of life, but the seeds of death and that the power of creation which sustains us will also destroy us, like the leprosy if we let it rot still in our vitals. This is the beginning of Gant's death. He realizes that he has given up his quest to create the art of the angel's smile, and so must die. This scene is paralleled in the last chapter when Eugene stands in the same location and is visited by Ben's shade. I don't guess it's given away too much. Ben passes away. It's very tragic in the, in the book. His vision marks his final break with Altamont, the home of his youth. He will avoid entombment within the town where his father suffered, the emotional suffocation that has been Ben's lot. For unlike them, he will be saved by his genius, by the miracle of his art. When the end comes for Ben, Eugene realizes the nightmare of destiny, that he is a part of the family of man where all their lust, their weakness, their sensuality, their fanaticisms, their strength, their rich taint were rooted in the marrow of his bones as well. And there is no escape. After all of the gut-wrenching torment of nightmare and death, after the soul-searching of love and fear, Eugene can believe that there is something over us all. Wolf called it man's search to find a father, the image of a, of, of a strength and wisdom external to his need and superior to his hunger to which the belief and power of his own life could be united. His quest for the happy lands has been foiled, but until the door is opened upon the lost time and reality penetrated, the quest must continue for Eugene Gant, the far wanderer, the myth maker. He must turn his search inward for he says, no leaf hangs for me in the forest. I 
shall find no door in my city, but in the city of myself, upon the continent of my soul, and I shall find forgetting, forgotten language, the lost world, a door where I may enter. He now finds his escape into life, away from his childhood Altamont. He is still upon his quest, seeking that ghost of memory in his consciousness where the mystery of reality might be recaptured and produced as art. Oh, lost by the wind grieved ghost, come back again. All right, thank you, Tim. And so finally, we have Ted Wadley, who's going to talk about Thomas Wolfe's reputation, how it rose, receded, and is sort of restoring some way to the Bronx. So Ted, uh, his family moved to Atlanta when he was nine years old, and he's made several attempts to escape, uh, with the most lengthy of being five years in California and five in Germany. Um, he attended Emory University and the University of Georgia and taught English at Perimeter College for 26 years with an emphasis on American literature. He has a professional interest in Southern writers and how those included in the rubric of, quote, Southern literature, unquote, have varied over time. None should be lost, even as others are rightfully included. All right, Ted. Hello. Hello, yes. Uh, well, I have mine structured as more of a conversation. And uh, so please join with me when you have okay. anything to say. <laughs> um, uh, Wolf's uh, the response in 1929 when Look Homeward Angel was published was uh, spectacular. Uh, it was uh, it was a bestseller. It got good critical reviews. Uh, it was featured in the popular press, and uh, he was envied by uh, other writers at the time. Uh, this was the age of uh, Faulkner and Hemingway, and uh, the, the other writers, his rivals for attention in some way, all had good things to say about Wolf. Uh, the length of the novel, we've been talking about that, um, was appealing to readers in an age before television. People wanted their money's worth. When uh, they bought a book, they wanted it to last. Uh, a lot of the uh, success, I think, of Look Homeward Angel had to do with, with its attention to us uh, growing up in a small town. This was also the age of uh, migration and urbanization in the United States and a lot of families. A lot of people had that experience of growing up in a somewhat constricting environment. In my own family, it was uh, it took two generations for my maternal ancestors to escape from Rome, Georgia. <laughs> and a lot of what I heard my mother had to say about living in Rome uh, mirrors some of the things uh, Wolf has to say about the people there. Uh, my mother never published her opinion of some of those people, so. Um, <laughs> She was able to return to Rome. <laughs> um, and then, uh, well, three of his four novels were bestsellers all the way through uh, You Can't Go Home Again. Uh, that's sort of a catchphrase for uh, a lot of his popularity. And uh, one, of the, one of the characteristics of uh, American literature, the fleeing male, uh, the need to escape. Finally, readers had a lot of sympathy and affection for Eugene. And this continued through uh, the Broadway play that was produced in the 50s, but that came later. Am I just gonna do this like oh, this? No. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, the critics at the time in uh, the early 30s, uh, Wolf was compared to uh, Dostoevsky, who's been mentioned. Uh, like Dostoevsky, uh, Wolf produces a fire hose of writing. If you've heard that uh, metaphor for somebody who just talks and talks and talks and it comes out like a fire hose and you can't uh, break that, uh, a diatribe. And it's fatalistic. Uh, Dostoevsky can be a very uh, depressing writer to read. And a lot of Wolf's fiction involves constant complaint that things are lost, that they can't be found, that 
there is no escape. He was compared with uh, Charles Dickens. Uh, that has to do with the length of his novels, with the vividness of his characters, and with the pathos with which he presents a lot of um, the situations. He was com he has always been compared since the beginning with Walt Whitman, once again because of the characters and the sort of portraits of Americans. Um, let's just say that Whitman is a lot more positive and optimistic about uh, the characters, the Americans that he presents than Wolf is. Um, and if I can also add, if I can add uh, to the Whitman thing too, it's the whole idea of, um, because Whitman used himself sort of as the example, you know, you know, it's song of myself, but he's really not necessarily narcissistic in, well, he is, but I mean, he means to include everyone. And I think Wolf did the same as well, that he uses himself, basically, it's, it's very autobiographical in his writing, but I think he wanted that, um, the, the readers to kind of sort of expand that to mean uh, Americans as a whole. Would you agree with that? Well, the, the Americans that he called his people. As, yes, as in, as, yes, yeah. exactly. No, I don't think he's inclusive of uh, Blacks and women, for example. Yeah. Um, he was uh, rated very highly and praised several times by William Faulkner. Uh, he consorted with uh, Hemingway and Fitzgerald when he went to Europe in the 30s. And uh, what also what made him popular uh, with his fellow writers was the awe they had at his sales, as his, at his success in making his way as a writer. I have a question there. Yeah. So one of the things that, um, there's an old compliment. I don't even know where it originated. The first time I saw it was Shelby Flett complimenting Cormac McCarthy. And he said, the real hero of the novel is the English language, um, which I think a lot of people would say about Thomas Wolfe. Yeah. And how, I mean, just from Tim Rosemary's excerpts, he writes very elevated in prose. It, it really impressed a lot of other writers. Let's see what y'all think of. It said a lot about the reading public that he was so popular because people don't write like that anymore. Uh, certainly, certainly not in bestsellers. Well, all of those writers were uh, famous for their prose, for their uh, ability to handle the English language. Uh, certainly, Hemingway, uh, in an opposite direction, with uh, with being concise and with leaving things out. And the reader has to think and fill in. With Wolf, it's a fire hose. It's, it, it's hard to think about it, except maybe to try to figure out what he's talking about. Um, Faulkner is compared. Faulkner's writing is compared to Wolf's in um, in some of the ways that Wolf uses um, uh, uh, obscure words. And uh, Faulkner's well known for uh, throwing. Uh, obscure words at you. Um, Fitzgerald was a master of uh, the poetic use of the English language. And my favorite quote along those lines was uh, what Nabokov had, to, Nabokov had to say about Lolita, that it was his love affair with the English language. Also one of controversial subjects. <laughs> I, I have to throw in one thing. Faulkner backed off of this phrase as well later in his life and, and sort of called him a gargantuan in the point, but was not much there, I guess, not as much, to be honest. I mean, that's what later, that was much later in that. That's true. So, just want to balance that. <laughs> well, that brings me to oh. Exxon. Uh, <laughs> my first, uh, I'm the number one cause of uh, the decline in his uh, yeah. reputation um, this is a little bit out of order because I'll mention something that happened before he died next. But the number one thing that happened was that he died. <laughs> and he died young. 37, I think. So. Yeah, almost 38. He was, uh, yeah. he, uh, it was unexpected. And uh, up until that time, he was this vigorous man. And uh, one one trope in the in the criticism, in the negative criticism of Wolf is this uh, giganticism 
and he himself was a, a very large man. And uh, his manuscripts were uh, very large. If you've seen, there's a fairly well-known picture of him showing up in the offices of the publisher with a uh, hand part with all the papers of his manuscript. And it, it's a very, very large pile that, he, that is sitting there. And uh, he's taller than that pile. <laughs> he's a large man. So when I say that's a trope, I think it's unfair. I think a lot of the criticism of Wolf is unfair. He was six five. Yeah, four five. Yeah, I mean, criticizing his writing because of his physical size is not is a cheap shot. Um, okay, at the time of his death, he was still writing and responding and standing up to some of this uh, criticism. But then, of course, he died. Okay, what had happened two years before? There was um, an infamous article published in the Saturday Review in 1936 uh, by Bernard DeVoto. And it, DeVoto sort of took advantage of uh, the lecture that Wolf gave that you referred to, the story of the Nile, because in that uh, lecture, Wolf had talked about how uh, his editor, Max Perkins, had uh, how much he had done to shape the book and make the success of uh, Look Homeward Angel. And uh, Devoto said the title of this article was Genius is Not Enough. And basically that Wolf uh, was formless and uh, didn't know how to put a novel together and that it, uh, it was done uh, by the editor. So Wolf was stung by that criticism and switched publishing houses. And uh, his other novels were published posthumously, and they also had to be put together by an editor. Uh, that was Edward Aswell, who was also for forced to cut and to paste and to form uh, masses of paper manuscript into the novels. Uh, as Tim was saying, uh, some of his rivals uh, were able to turn on Wolf, and he was unable to respond. Uh, in a younger generation, something that was uh, popular when uh, when I was in college, uh, Styron said of Wolf that he was wonderful for a young reader, painful for a grown man. <laughs> and Kurt Vonnegut agreed that Wolf goes down e easier when one is 18. <laughs> I do think this has, this touches on also reasons that Wolf is popular, um, particularly with uh, young men, because Look Homeward Angel uh, is, is very frankly sexual, the novel and the coming of age that Tim was talking about uh, includes lots of uh, Eugene Gantz, uh, uh, flirtations and experiences and longings uh, along those lines that um, uh, teenage boys, especially, I think, can, ad can identify with. Um, the term Southern Renaissance was not coined until the early 1950s, and there was a recognition that something had happened in uh, in Southern literature, uh, basically after the First World War. Um, I think it was Alan Tate who said that the South rejoined the Union after the First World War, which was something that was also said in uh, my mother's family in Rome. Uh, but Robert Penn Warren and uh, Cleoth Brooks and John Crow Ransom had in putting together the uh, the canon of what the Southern Renaissance was, uh, there were problems with Wolf. He was neither as important nor as Southern as Faulkner. He he had neither former formal elegance nor moral reverence. That second term is important, um, especially for people like Tate and Warren, that there that there was a uh, a moral aspect uh, to literature that it was uh, it was supposed to bring out and reinforce and teach uh, lessons 
whereas Wolf was boorish and egotistical. And he was also defensive when some of these things were pointed out. He was defensive about the Devoto article and uh, he got rid of Perkins and changed the publishing house. Um, and paradoxically, the Gants could be seen as Snopeses, if you know the, the, uh, the people who come in and take over uh, the town in uh, some of Faulkner's novels, uh, uh, especially uh, the Hamlet, yeah, the town. Um, Dixieland, his mother's boarding house, uh, was certainly a demi -monde. She was in it for the money, and she did not have any qualms about taking women of uh, loose morals uh, as uh, as tenants in the house. This part of uh, Eugene's sexual awakening took place in his mother's boarding house. Uh, Thomas Wolfe himself uh, was uh, always attracted to older women. And then finally, uh, there was the fact that uh, uh, Asheville Altamont was seen as part of Appalachia and the prejudice against uh, uh, the Appalachians, that they were backwards, that they were inbred, that they were hillbillies, that they were somehow the other, does not apply uh, to Thomas Wolfe, but he's not from Oxford, Mississippi. <laughs> Yeah, he's not from Tuscaloosa, Alabama, or even Milledgeville, Georgia. So, um, he's from Chapel Hill. <laughs> I told you all of these are cheap shots. <laughs> they are the, the idea that Max Perkins uh, was, you know, the creator of the novel. Well, then I guess uh, Ezra Pound was the creator of the wasteland. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Maxwell Perkins, in an in introduction he wrote, mm -hmm. um, addressed that. And he said that his editorial work with Wolf was not fundamentally different from his work with Hemingway or Fitzgerald. Exactly. I think one of Wolf's final letters was to Max Perkins. Just, you know, they, he was like a second father. He really was. If you see the movie Genius, uh, you'll, you'll see that. That, that. that relationship was important all of his life. He just professionally had to break with Perkins because of that article. It really seemed that way. Well, Wolf was defensive about that. He was sensitive. Yeah, he was wounded. Right. He was going to prove that he could do it without Perkins. But then he died. And so as well had to do what Perkins had done. That's where we get all of the novels. It's where we get the short stories. Some of the stories were published uh, in Wolf's uh, uh, lifetime, but then they end up as chapters in the novels, right? His, his stuff is episodic. I mean, there's no doubt. I mean, it, it's a, uh, I think Rubin, Lewis Rubin called it uh, his chronological law, you know, the one that did stay in time, but he did switch around. He was very much influenced by Joyce. He, he wasn't as, probably as good as Joyce, but that but Certainly was influenced. Um, another thing that happened about that time in the 50s and 60s was um, the importance of new criticism and that, uh, that Wolf was not a good fit uh, to the new critics. Um, I said before that he'd been criticized for a lack of formal elegance and in general for a lack of artistry that uh, his, uh, his writing was formless, it was bombastic, that he suffered from uh, logorrhea, <laughs> which is a play on diarrhea, only it's words coming out of your mouth. <laughs> yeah, that, that fire hose, as I called it before. Um, one, J.B. Priestley said in, in an article, in, in one of his books, talking about four great American authors, Hemingway, uh, Faulkner, Anyway, he includes Wolf. He said he never really learned to organize a novel. And he said he went on and on and on, but he went in and in and in, and that's his value. That's right. 
And in terms of the new critics and uh, Elliot and uh, some of the other people I was mentioning, uh, Wolf's do not Wolf's novels do deal with uh, the modern modernist uh, problems of alienation and uh, fatalism that we find in those other writers. Uh, there was also the feeling that uh, the Broadway play from like 1957, uh, Look Homeward Angel, was uh, was better than the book. Uh, once again, that's a product of editing. I mean, the Broadway play is only the end of the book. It's Ben's death is the big thing that happens in, in and it's in Dixieland, the boarding house, and and uh, the protagonist uh, escapes to Chapel Hill. So um, pulpit Hill, yeah, pulpit. Uh, I would like to see that. I think Andy, we should revive that. <laughs> That would be a good revival. To, uh, uh, Anthony Perkins played uh, uh, Eugene Gant, a young Anthony Perkins, and oh, and the other, the actresses, the one people who played the mother and the girlfriend and so forth were all very well known at the time. Uh, fantastic reviews, long run. Um, it needs to be revived. Wolf, of course, started as a dramatist in Chapel Hill. He went to a workshop at Harvard. To write plays and got his master's in it. So that was like the first attempt to his book. Right. Okay, further things that happened in uh, the decline of uh, Thomas Wolfe's literary reputation. Um, something that I would call um, the revolution in English departments <laughs> from the 1960s to the 1990s. Uh, there was a quote that I started looking for to a quotation um, when preparing for this. And I can't really find it, but somebody said, this might have been in uh, around 1980, that uh, the radicals tried to take over society, but had to settle for the English department. <laughs> and that was something that was going on when I was in graduate school in the 70s, and basically throughout my career. And uh, a lot of the older, male professors were being pushed aside and uh, women and feminists and, uh, same, same. right uh, were coming in and uh, we could talk about that for a while but anyway that did happen and there was a kind of puritanism i would call it that that happened with that and the frankly sexual nature of uh, a lot of what wolf wrote especially his first and most famous most well-read book, Look Homeward Angel, uh, was sexual and was not what was now in vogue from a young man's perspective and the view of the women and so forth. Uh, and the next one was a privileging of race and gender in terms of literary criticism. And frankly, uh, Wolf's work is very often offensive. Uh, I would say that it's gratuitously racist. That if you compare it with writers like Faulkner, for example, that Faulkner is less gratuitous about it. There's a reason for a lot of his racism. And he, and he does a lot more with uh, African-American characters in, in a, a lot of his book, Intruder in the Dust, for example, is, is one that's easier to teach. Uh, Wolf is also sort of sexist. You know, there are no uh, really round female characters. There's little redeeming attention paid to female or non-white characters. And uh, that's easy to attack. It's easy to attack in, in, in Wolf. Um, and then finally, I have uh, societal philistinism, uh, a loss of appreciation for art in general, uh, for literature, for poetry, for music in societies. Uh, if we if we go back to the 50s and 60s, that was a heyday for what we call liberal education. It was valued. The humanities were central, seen as central 
to uh, a university education. Literature was, was one of the apexes of the humanities. Uh, people were proud in the United States of American literature because we did have the Southern Renaissance. We did have uh, the Harlem Renaissance. We, we did have these great writers that we've been talking about. And um, there was a lot of pride in that. College students uh, up until about the mid 70s uh, were more interested in culture and being well-rounded and uh, developing a philosophy of life than in being well off. But since then, we've had increasing tuition, as we all know. Uh, there's been a decline in the values, I think, in American society, at least in terms of appreciation of art and music and literature. Uh, by the 2000s, by, by 20 years ago, uh, most students who went to college said they were doing it for money, for career, for the salary. And uh, if you look at colleges, uh, marketing materials, marketing materials today, <laughs> trying to get, uh, it, it, it's all about how much more money you'll make if you, uh, if you choose uh, this college instead of that, and you choose this major instead of that. So if we also have then the political attack on liberal arts, which just shows that people have no idea what liberty means. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the end of uh, the decline. <laughs> so we have a little time for. Um, so we appreciate uh, one more point. Oh, uh, okay. no, well, I've still got the reevaluation. I know we got. We'll have to leave a little time for questions and answers. Oh, I don't know what time. It is. So we're two oh seven. We go to two fifteen. Oh, okay. So one important point is that Wolf includes one of the only. Yes, I don't I think I don't know. Oh. Um, one really important point from your in the reevaluation is that Wolf wrote one of the only and one of the great depictions of a pandemic, um, which all of a sudden makes him a lot more relevant um, because he did write about the Spanish flu epidemic of 1918. The pandemic of 1918. Yeah. It started in Kansas. But that's what that's how Ben died. Ben died in the pandemic in 1919. You gave it away. <laughs> you gave it away. You, you gave it. I did. Okay. Yeah. yeah. It, it does talk about that. The causes were closing. I mean, people were dying from this. So, yeah, very much so. Well, we've mentioned a lot of the other things I have. You could. You could tell from Tim's presentation that uh, people are attracted to Wolf nowadays because of his passion, his romantic ideals, his epochal vision. Um, on, on the other hand, uh, questions about sexuality, uh, people's feelings of isolation and loneliness, um, I wrote, are making a comeback in uh, our society today. Um, and the short stories. Um, the short stories uh, have the advantage of being shorter. <laughs> they have the advantage of being well edited and well formed, a lot of them. Uh, you, we talked about I have a thing to tell you. I also recommend a story called The Company, which is a good example of proletarian literature about a, a young working person coming of age by recognizing just what the, the forces and the abuses of uh, capitalism are. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. All right. So we have time for questions from the audience. You can, uh, someone's reading the feed from the virtual audience. Uh, we can type it into the Q&A or the chat. We'll see them as well as in person. So anyone like to ask a question? Yes. Just a quick factual question from uh, Tim. Did you say there was a movie about Maxwell Perkins? I think it's uh, yeah. Can, yeah. can you say it's, your question into the microphone? Right. Oh, uh, the question is, uh, I had mentioned that there was a movie 
made from uh, Max Perkins things called Genius. Yeah. Yes, it is, and it's a yes. a British cast. They all speak good in good American English. <laughs> uh, I mean, they do it much better than we do British. Uh, but uh, and uh, if you, see, it's very worthwhile if you're interested in Thomas Wolf. Jude Law plays Tom Wolf. He's only about you know six inches shorter, whatever. <laughs> but this also hooks him up with Charles Pleasure's character too, as a, from Appalachia. Uh, he's played two now, I guess, but he plays Wolf, and Wolf is all over the place in this movie. You should see it. I really recommend it. It's good. It may be on YouTube. I have. I bought a copy of. It. Yes, it's. Uh, it. I think it's very well done, and and he shows that. Yeah, you know, shows Max Perkins riding on the train back to his home after from downtown Manhattan, and he's flipping through it, and he's freaking out. This is so good. And it's a wonderful depiction, I think, of that, to give you the idea that Wolf was turned down by, what, a hundred yeah. publishers or something at that time for that book, because it was huge. It was just from August. But Perkins said he would work with it, and they did finally turn it into two novels, at least from that first edition of stuff. Then the other two that came later were the stacks that Ted was telling you about. And the uh, name of the movie? Genius. And it's based on uh, the biography of Maxwell Perkins. It's, it's really it's for Max Perkins' involvement with uh, Thomas Wolfe and Eileen Bernstein, who was his uh, mistress, married uh, mistress, but that other time, yeah. And uh, it, you know, played by an Australian actress. <laughs> I recommend it if you want to, you know, do it. It's very good. Yes. Thank you all for speaking today. I've really enjoyed it. Uh, Rosemary, you. you made the comment about short stories. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm with the Thomas Wolfe Society. And at our conference at the end of May, the theme is the short stories of Thomas Wolfe. Mm -hmm. And we are inviting 15 different high institutions to attend three. And we try to get Thomas Wolfe back in the classroom because it's so difficult. Nobody's going to read a 600-page book as a student uh, and participate mm -hmm. as they should. But if you enjoy the short stories and go through the short stories, you'll have a foundation to appreciate his larger works. And I encourage all of you, if you're interested in short stories, to check out the Thomas Wolfe Memorial because we had been doing short stories for several years on Zoom. And we do two a month in the spring, two a month in the fall. And out of his short stories, we're talking about a 15-year plan to go through his short stories. And hopefully we'll do it again. And it's been fun. Uh, but thank you, Rosemary. Thank you. Thank um, you. And what, another thing, too, that I found really interesting in looking at The Child by Tiger is to um, sort of look at how that story was by itself because it was published um, in 1937 as, as a story. And then it was later incorporated into the novel, The Web and the Rock. But to sort of see how that story was kind of modified and how it was adapted to fit the scheme of the novel was really very interesting. I mean, because it's a powerful story in and of itself, but then to see it in sort of another form too is really also fascinating. And it's interesting that uh, about half the papers that uh, are going to be presented are about race. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but Tim, I've got a question for you. Um, a stone will leave an unfound door. I know where you're going. I know where you're well, going. I have a question. Okay. What does it mean? My take. And this wasn't my idea, was that a stone is the permanent, our permanent nature, our legacy. A leaf is our temporary state. My question to you is what is the door? Is it spirituality? Is is the can you say this question? The question? Oh, the question is in the in the stone, uh, you know, a stone, a leaf, an unfound door, a door. What do they represent? And you were saying that the stone is the uh, well. For me, it's 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 the earthly earth. earth. I mean, it's very close to what you were saying. Uh, and and the leaf is the organic world part of it. Uh, 
there's the material, the, you know, the heart, and, and then the unfound door or the door is that which we find to the spiritual element of our lives. So I think you might agree with that. I hope. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> that I think that's what he was getting at to me. That we live in all three of those, and we if we neglect the spiritual, yeah, so that's going to be a problem. Mm -hmm. Yes. I had a, a quick question. So for the novice reader, what would be a good suggestion for a short story or two for them to begin with? Just read please. Please to the panel. Anyway. Yeah. yeah. Best place to start. First thing that you read from Thomas. And hopefully not a 600 page novel. <laughs> that was the problem with the law. Yeah. <laughs> A specific short story? Right. Well, certainly I would recommend The Child by Tiger. I know it's anthologized frequently. Um, obviously, the editors are going to agree with me that that's a good place to start. Um, again, it, that one can be very controversial. Um, but um, I, I think in a lot of ways, you have a lot of quintessential wolf in that story. So that's another good one. Although I'm sort of interested now in uh, Chickamauga. Um, which is kind of the Civil War account um, of, of Thomas Wolfe. So, um, you know, then there, his short stories have so many different dimensions. Um, it, it's hard to say that one is, is, is like, you know, like the one. But, but for students, probably The Child by Tiger. I have actually taught that many times in class, and, um, and, and it, it works well with students. I would say just to read the prelude to the Comrade Angel with the stone relief. Yeah. Uh, and just let that see what that does to you. And because a lot of times, just coming back just to that, and eventually you'll say, okay, I got to do it. I got to read the rest of it. If you can write like that. Uh, in, yeah. mm -hmm. in the Norton Anthology of Southern Literature, which came out, I think, 98, the first time it came out, and mainly from Chapel Hill, editors, I think, Trigger Harris uh, and people. Uh, and it excerpts Ben, the chapter on Ben, which is so powerful. And that's about all you can, I mean, of 500 word pages that are, is the most intense. And so you, they lead up to it in the introduction, and then they, they have that story. Um, that's, that, that, how, I don't know how to handle Wolf any other way, really. Seems like a powerful episode from the novel. <clears throat> what else? Well, we are out of time, unfortunately, but uh, I wanted to say yeah, real quickly. I want to say something real quick. I want to remember when I, my first teacher that taught this novel to me when I was a soft, a freshman, second semester in Chapel Hill. Her name is Constance uh, Raymond. Uh, and my first paper literally in college was on this. My last paper was in Kenneth England's class at Georgia State. <laughs> and I wanted to point that out. We have the two Kenneth England professorships right here on us in our I missed us. And thank you so much for coming. Uh, but uh, I, I think it will live on. I think uh, everybody who takes Southern literature seriously will consider it. It does have all those bad, the negative words and language, just as Faulkner does. But please note, that the word Negro or whatever is used in the book too. It's not all the way through. It's not, it's just something that we have across we have to bear in Southern literature, it seems. That that's the reality of what the language was at the time. And hopefully we it won't appear anymore. You know, just look at it that way. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you to all our panelists and our audience. Three p.m. Final session. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you.